let's discuss about the anatomy of landmarks of maxillary and the mandibular denture bearing areas. The landmarks can broadly be discussed under three main headings limiting structures, supporting structures, and the relief areas. As we all know, it is very important to know about the anatomy in detail. We'll discuss it in small parts. In this part, I will explain about the limiting structures of maxillary arch. The limiting structures of maxillary arch are the labial frenum, labial vestibule, buccal frenum, buccal vestibule, hamilar notch, and the posterior palatal area. Labial frenum. When viewed from front, the first limiting structure is the labial frenum and it is a fold of mucous membrane at the median line normally single and sometimes double. It is a thick band of mucosa connecting mu mucosa of the alveolar ridge to the upper lip. It starts superiorly from the inner surface of the lip in a fan shape and attaches to the labial side of the ridge. It has no muscle attachment of its own and so no action of its own. It corresponds to the midline of face and can be noted during the teeth setting and denture delivery. If this frenum is very prominent, the denture will get dislodged easily during functional movements of lip, especially like pursing of lip. In labial frenum, if labial frenum is prominent, the phrenectomy can be done or adequate relief can be given during peripheral mo border molding and the impression making procedures. The frenal attachment has been classified by House as class 1, 2 and 3. Class 1 is high in maxilla or low in mandible with respect to the crest of ridge. Class 2 is medium and class 3 is the frenae encroaches the onto the crest of the ridge and may interfere with danger seal and might require surgical correction. Coming to the clinical significance. Labial frenum is recorded by elevating the lip and extending it in an outward and inward direction. The corresponding danger landmark in the impression is a labial notch. Labial notch in maxillary danger must be just wide and deep enough to allow the frenum to pass through it. Next is the labial vestibule. The labial vestibule is a portion of the oral cavity that is bounded on one side by the teeth, gingiva and alveolar ridge and on the other side by the lips anterior to buccal frenum. It is divided into right and left vestibules by the labial frenum. Clinical significance. The corresponding danger landmark area seen in the Impression is called as the labial flange area. This lies between the labial and the buccal frenum. The main muscle of the lip which forms the outer surface of the labial uh, vestibule is the orbicularis oris. Its tone depends on the support it receives from the labial flange and the position of the teeth. In this part, the functional depth is less because of the particular attachment of muscle fibers. Here fibers are attached perpendicular to the crest of the alveolar ridge and therefore when the fibers contract the denture gets dislodged easily. Buccal frenum. The normal location of buccal frenum is between the canine and the first premo premolars. Usually buccal frenum will be multiple, thicker and broader than the labial frenum. Buccal frenum becomes active during whistling or blowing action or during the pronunciation of V or W. So adequate relief should be given to this and functional movements should be recorded accordingly. It is related to three muscles. They are the levator angli oris, orbicularis oris and the buccinator. Levator angli oris is attached beneath the frenum and affects its position. Orbicularis oris pulls it forward and buccinator pulls it backward. Coming to the clinical significance. It is recorded as a buccal notch in the impression. It is recorded by elevating and pulling the cheek outward, downward and inward. Moved backward and forward to simulate the movements of the frenum. It requires more clearance for its action 
than the labial frenum and is crescentric in form. Another clinical significance is that it acts as a valuable guidance in the selection of teeth as the canine eminence is lost in most of the cases after extraction. That is, the distance between the mesial side of one buccal frenum to the other is equal to the combined width of the upper six anterior teeth that is from canine to canine in anteriors. Coming to the buccal vestibule. It is defined as the portion of oral cavity that is bounded on one side by the teeth, gingiva and the alveolar ridge and on the lateral side by cheek posterior to the buccal frenula. The buccal vestibule lies opposite to the tuberosity and extends from buccal frenum to the hamula notch. The size of the buccal vestibule varies with contraction of the buccinator muscle, the position of mandible and the amount of bone loss from the maxilla. The size and the shape of the distal buccal flange of the denture must be adjusted to the ramus and the coronoid process of the mandible and to the masseter muscle. Buccal flange is border molded by extending the cheek outward, downward and inward. The patient is asked to open wide and move mandible side to side. The clinical significance of the buccal frenum is the origin of zygomatic process of the maxilla or the root of the zygoma in that region. The mucosa covering this region is very thin and non-compressible when compared to the adjacent area. Therefore, during the function, this area can act as a fulcrum and dislodge the danger. And this, in this area, mucosa get easily ulcer ulcerated. Coming to the hamula notch. Hamula notch is a displaceable area about 2 mm wide between the tuberosity and the maxilla and hamula process of the medial pterygoid plate. It is also called as a pterygomaxillary notch. It can be located by using mouth mirror so that the edge drops into a definitive depression. Its clinical significance. This notch is used as a boundary of po posterior border of the maxillary denture at the back of the tuberosity. The impression should not end on the tuberosity otherwise it will result in non-retentive denture because peripheral seal is not possible in the non-resilient area of tuberosity. The tissue in the center of the deep part of hamula notch consists of thick submucosa made up of loose areolar tissue and can be safely displaced by the posterior palatal border of the danger to help in uh, achieving a seal in this region called as the pterygomaxillary seal. The tip of the pterygoid hamulus is 2 to 3 mm posterior medial to the distal limit of maxillary residual ridge. However, it may be located on the line with crest of ridge or sometimes even lateral to this line. This variation is significant in that it affects the length and the direction of pterygomaxillary seal. So, it becomes very important to determine the location of hamulus by palpation. Overextensions at the hamula notches will not be tolerated because of the pressure on the pterygoid hamulus and interference with the pterygomandibular raphe which extends from hamulus to the top inside back corner of the retromolar pad in the mandible. If the denture is extended too far into the hamula notch, the mucous membrane covering the raphe will be traumatized because when the mouth is opened wide, the pterygomandibular raphe is pulled forward and the boundaries of hamula notch are anteriorly it is bounded by the base of zygomatic process posteriorly by the hamula notch, medially by maxillary tuberosity, laterally by the coronoid process and inferiorly by the crest of residual ridge. The next is the coronomaxillary space, the space which most of the people forget during recording and this has its clinical importance. The coronomaxillary space is that anatomic region that lies medial to the coronoid process and lateral to the maxillary tuberosity. Coming to the clinical significance, to get maximum retentive qualities of processes each patient should be evaluated for the variation in coronomaxillary space size during mandibular opening. 
as the size of the space is primarily influenced by the action of the coronoid process the coronoid process may be relatively straight or vertical for these patients the opening of mandible can result in narrowing of the space in the picture we can see the space getting narrower or that space you can assess in the diagram very well whereas in some patient coronal process appears to flare laterally at its height for these patients space often remain same or becomes wider during opening of the mouth if the space narrows during opening any horizontal over extension into the space would result in the denture base contact and loss of retention it is recorded by border molding procedure which include opening and closing together with protrusion and lateral movements of the jaw if the coronary coronomaxillary space broadens or remains the same size on opening then a gentle molding of the region by pulling the cheek out down and inward is done <coughs> the last limiting structure is the posterior palatal seal area the posterior palatal seal area or the post dam area is a soft tissue area at or beyond the junction of hard and soft palates on which pressure within physiological limits can be applied by a complete denture to aid in its retention posterior palatal seal area has got two areas that is a pterygomaxillary seal and the post palatal seal the shape of posterior palatal seal area is similar to a cupid bow the attachment of soft tissue to the posterior part of the bony hard palate is the true junction between hard and soft palate during functional movement the vibration takes place slightly posterior to this true junction this junction is the vibration line this junction is called the vibration line the area between the true junction and the vibrating line is soft and compressible hence the posterior palatal seal is placed in this part and the posterior palatal seal area lies between the anterior and posterior vibrating lines the anterior vibrating line is an imaginary line located at the junction of the attached tissues overlying the hard and mobile tissues of the immediately adjacent soft palate it is it is located in the patient or is recorded in the patient by performing the valsalva mano method and also by instructing the patient to say a ah, in short vigorous burst the anterior vibrating line is also on soft palatal tissues the valsalva mano method is performed by asking the patient to blow through the nose while closing the nostrils during recording and the posterior vibrating line is recorded by instructing the patient to say a ah, in short burst in normal unexaggerated manner and the posterior vibrating line is an imaginary line at the junction of aponeurosis of the tensor velli palatini muscle and the muscular portion of the soft palate posterior palatal borders has got both width and depth the width of the posterior palatal region is the distance from the true junction to the vibrating line and depth of the posterior palatal seal area varies according to the movement of the soft palate depending upon the nature of soft palate there are three types of attachment that is class 1 2 and 3 which was given by house the attachment in type 1 the attachment is more or less horizontal and the soft palate needs to move very little to get contact with the posterior pharyngeal wall this is most favorable for obtaining the posterior palatal seal type 2 or the class 2 has got the medium attachment and type 3 has got very low attachment and here the soft palate needs to travel to get proper seal with the pharyngeal wall and type 3 soft palate is something like a curtain falling abruptly from the hard palate and hence the posterior palatal seal area is minimum it is very difficult to get a proper seal or retention in the soft in this type of 
class 3 type of patients. The different methods of recording the posterior palatal seal, its function and its role in retention of complete dangers and all will be discussed in our later videos. Do watch other videos.